time because the, the others were either in New York or San Francisco. Okay, so, um, oh, the clicker doesn't work. So first I'm gonna start with talking about Quora a little bit. So let me have a show of hands. How many people in the audience are active Quora users as of now? Okay, uh, let's say maybe 15, 20%. Uh, with an optimistic uh, uh, view. Uh, so I hope by the end of the day this grows, by the way. So we have a booth outside where you can go. You can not only sign up, you can just see how it works. I'm gonna be talking a lot about Quora, uh, what it means in terms of sort of like uh, the product what we're trying to get, but also all the different places where machine learning comes into play in Quora. So let's start a little bit with the mission. Um, so the mission at Quora is to share and grow the world's knowledge. Uh, there are different ways you can think about this and different ways you can think about growing and sharing the world's knowledge. We think that questions and answers is sort of like a primary way to do that, right? Uh, people have a lot of questions that um, sometimes they try to formulate in the form of queries that they enter into a search engine, but fundamentally there are questions they want to search for, they want to get an information to, and then there are a ton of answers that you can get to. Um, ways to address that traditionally have been, for example, an encyclopedia or Wikipedia, right? You have an article about some topic that uh, tries to aggregate a lot of knowledge on something uh, into a given article, in our case, we do it in a different way. We basically have a question that is formulated by someone or by many people, and we allow to give different answers to it, which might introduce different ways to look at the same problem, different opinions, and so on. For example, if you go and look at the machine learning questions, uh, there's a popular question on what's the difference between L1, L2 regularization, where you'll see there are a ton of different interpretations and views on a topic, which is actually um, interesting because you can address it from a purely statistical perspective, from a machine learning perspective, from a practical application point of view, and all of those combined create a lot of different knowledge. Um, so we have millions of questions and answers, millions of users, uh, thousands of different topics, and all of that actually yeah, creates this kind of interesting uh, world of data and data relations, which uh, I think that's what creates some of the fun challenges and applications that we have, right? So if you think, if, if you look at it, um, so we have, sorry, let me see if I can use the pointer here. At least I can have this, okay, yeah. So we have users uh, that can follow other users. They can endorse users for a given topic. Uh, we have users that can not only follow other users but follow topics. We have users who write questions and answers. We have users who upvote and downvote uh, questions and answers. Users who also want answers on questions. We have answers that have upvote and downvote, questions that have answers, and questions that have topics. So I guess um, one way to see it about it is we have this uh, mm, graph with different kinds of nodes where we have users, questions, answers, topics, upvotes, downvotes, and all of this data and data types uh, gets combined in some of the different applications of machine learning that I will be talking about in the next few slides. Um, some of the other interesting things, that this, this creates sort of like this interesting uh, complex network with different data types and different data propagating in different ways. Um, I'm not going to go into details about for example, this, uh, there was an interesting post in our blog, uh, data blog, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, so I recommend you go and look at it, uh, how upvotes propagate in a complex network and how the network structure of different users and different topics and different questions and answers has an influence on how that propagates. So that's in our blog post. Another interesting thing, which is probably different from many applications you usually hear about, is the importance of sort of like semantics and topics in what we care about, right? And how the different topics relate to each other. We put a lot of care into curating the uh, topic ontology and that creates another form of uh, network and that also has a lot of interesting applications on uh, our, our machine learning world. Okay, so what do we care about? Uh, so interestingly, we don't care about people clicking on ads and that's something that it's, uh, different from many companies and the reason is we are uh, for now a startup that doesn't care about generating revenue which is uh, pretty interesting uh, but we do care about very in uh, um, 
three different aspects which I think are pretty unique. Uh, one of them is the one that everybody cares about, which is basically relevant, uh, what is relevant to the user and what the user is going to click on. But the other two are not so... Uh, demand is probably also um, you know, a typical one, but quality is something that mm, most other sites or other applications will not put so much thought into. And that's something that for us at Quora is sort of like essential. We don't want to gain um, relevant or clicks at the cost of quality, and that's something that it's very easy to fall into that trap. It's like uh, you can have jokes and meme, uh, memes coming into the site and getting a, lot, a ton of clicks, and that's something that we actually actively fight against, uh, which is interesting because it creates this tension between relevance, demand, and quality, which um, we'll see some of it now when we start talking about some of the machine learning applications. Okay, so now that uh, we know a little bit about Quora, let's talk about some of the machine learning that's happening there. And when I get the question from many people like, why did you switch from Netflix to Quora? Um, one of the things I say is like, there's a ton of machine learning uh, applications and challenges at Quora. Uh, so that's some of it is what I'm gonna be talking about right now. So, uh, as in many other companies um, and many other sites, ranking is one of the key things that we do in many different ways, but we sometimes do it very differently. So one um, interesting application is answer ranking. So an answer ranking is one of the first places where we see this concept of quality coming into play, and it's a very important one. So um, we want to rank according to what we consider is a good answer. Now, the concept of a good answer to a question is not a trivial one. And if you look at the, there's an official post on Quora that talks about what does it represent to be a good answer, and there's a ton of things about what we think is a good answer. Some of the words you'll see are things like truthful, it needs to be reusable, provide explanation, it needs to be well formatted, and so on and so forth, right? So to a question like what music do, did a scientist usually listen to while working, um, I mean, this is not a scientific question, uh, although it relates to scientists, but it's an opinion question. But you need to be able to rank the different answers that you'll get, right? And um, how do you do that in a way that you are actually doing it uh, according to what the company itself says is a good answer? So what we need to do is translate some of those dimensions into features, of course, and then uh, use a traditional learning to rank algorithm to rank the answers. Um, so features that we use relate to the quality of the text itself. So we do care, as I said, about quality, and there are ways to encode the quality of the text. Actually, there's a lot of work and literature about how to mm, think about text quality, even about how to automatically grade uh, essays uh, by students, for example. So those kind of features come in very handy for doing things like that. Um, so interaction features are also very important. Upvote, downvote, did people like, did, didn't they like? Uh, uh, those are important, but they're tricky because they uh, say more about the sort of like relevance aspect. So you could get here a lot of upvote on a meme, for example, or a joke. So you need to put a lot of care on to how you to interpret those interactions. And then another set of features, which I'll talk uh, uh, later on, is user expertise and trust, right? So you know a lot about a user, you can trust a user in a topic, and you can also trust the interaction of the users on a given topic with given answers and questions. So that's something that goes into play into our learning to rank for answer ranking. We do this uh, for now in an unpersonalized way uh, because here we're just basically worrying about the quality aspect and we uh, consider that it's uh, the most important thing is to get, uh, get it right in terms of like what's a good answer. Uh, eventually in the future I think we'll get to a point where we can actually also introduce personalization here but for now this is an unpersonalized learning to rank. But we do a lot of personalization in many other different places. So for example the feed which is the home page that you see when you get to Quora, um, either web or the app. Um, it's a personalized learning to rank approach. So here, the goal is to present the most interesting stories for a given user. Uh, when we talk about stories, by the way, is this combination of um, answers, questions, also blog posts, because we have internal blog posts. Um, and when we talk about interestingness, we talk about 
topical relevance, so is the uh, question related to a topic the user is interested on, social relevant, uh, rel um, relevance, timeliness. So there's different aspects that come into play to actually figure out whether something is interesting or not. So again, same thing, we take those elements that we consider are important, turn them into features, and we uh, apply a machine learning algorithm. What kind of features we take into account here? So things like the quality of the question and the answer, again, the topics the user is interested on and or knows about, um, the users that the user is following, so the social networks uh, and solo, social follow graph, what is trending, what is popular, and other kinds of features. Um, we do that over different temporal windows, and we have um, a multi-stage solution with different kinds of streams. Uh, what this means is like, it's very hard to implement a fully online ranking approach uh, with the volume that we have, and especially with the requirements on timeliness of some of the trending topics that we care about. Um, so we do have some different sort of like stages where we rank different uh, stories and different, uh, different feats, and then we combine them into, into one. Okay, so learning to rank, personalized learning to rank is a way of recommendation. We have a ton of different other recommendations going on in this site. For example, one of them is recommending new topics for the user to follow. As I said before, users can explicitly decide to follow topics, and because of that and because of the different interactions the user will have with the different questions and answers, we know a lot about what other topics the user might be interested in following. And we have a recommendation algorithm here that is based on other topics the user is following, other users, users that the uh, user is following, and the topics they're interested on, the interactions, some topic user features, and so on. Similarly, we do recommend users. So we, re we will recommend you users that you might be interested in following based on a related set of features, not exactly the same, but other users you're following, topics you're interested, and so on. Um, related questions, and uh, again, each time that I'm adding here a new slide, I'm basically talking about a different algorithmic approach and a different machine learning model with a different set of features, but of course, they share a lot of uh, in common. Um, so related questions, here are the question, what we're trying to um, answer is, given you're interested in question A, what other questions you might be interested on, right? Uh, it's not an issue only of similarity, we know that, and anyone that has worked on sort of like related anything knows that this is not only about similarity, it's about interestingness, and it's about uh, many different features that go into trying to figure out whether a question is related to another. Um, actually, even quality of the question might be something that is um, related. So we use different set of features here again, textual features, um, those come into play in different places as you have seen, co-visits, topics, and so on. This is a very interesting, um, one of the most important applications of this is in the logged out case when we get visitors that come from a search engine, for example, and they're not logged in into our application, and they're looking at an answer for a question they typed into a query engine external like uh, Google or Bing, um, they will then see a lot of related questions they might be interested on in following up with. Um, an extreme came case of being related is to being a duplicate, and here now we are extremely talking about similarity. So duplicate questions is a very interesting and not such a trivial problem for Quora. We don't want to have uh, a ton of different versions of the same questions that are being answered by different people or even the same people having, having to copy and paste their answer to n versions of the same question, right? So we need to detect where questions are duplicate and it's not an easy thing to detect, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, even us personally, we uh, sometimes are looking at two questions saying, are they, do they really mean the same or not? Uh, so it's not about verbatim copy of the same question, which that's a trivial uh, problem. It's more about do they mean the same, right? Um, so we train um, a, a binary classifier here with mm, trying to identify what are duplicates and what are not duplicates and we use vector space models uh, on the textual features and then a lot of different usage based features that also give us a lot of information about whether the interactions are very similar on two questions and therefore can be classified as mm, being a duplicate. 
Um, I already talked about uh, needing to use user and trust in different places, and actually there is a specific model that we use um, to work on how to infer uh, user trust and expertise. So we have a lot of interesting information on that. We know whether a user has written answers on a given topic. We know what's been the response of other users on those answers. Did the user get upvotes or downvotes on the, those answers? Uh, we also have endorsements, which is another feature that I think I haven't talked to, I haven't talked about. So you can, um, you can endorse a user on a given topic, and that propagates through the network, uh, because of course, as we many of you might know, trust propagates through the network, right? So if I know about machine learning and I endorse Misha, uh, that m means more than if a random people on the, a person on the street uh, endorses me on physics, because uh, we don't know who that person is. Um, so this is a model that is actually taken into account by other different algorithms and is fed as a feature. And uh, I think that's for us and, and for anyone that's worked in a sort of like a complex ecosystem of different machine learning um, applications, it's a typical thing. You build a model with a purpose and a use, but that, the output of that model ends up being the input to the next model, right? And that's a typical thing that happens. Uh, so this is both at the same time, sort of like a model in itself, but a feature that is fed into other models that learn uh, different things from it. Okay. Um, trending topics. I think this is my final application. Um, we, also, we also care about figuring out what's trending and popular right now, and we do that in a personalized way, and we show this to people in a way that we are taking into account not only the global trendiness, but what's trending in your social circle or uh, uh, close to you in your social network and your user interest. But this is also a very interesting way to address sort of like cold start and exploration uh, on the topical ontology that I was mentioning before. So when you get a new user coming in, um, typically will only express interest uh, in a few topics. And you have to, we do have the topic recommendation that I mentioned before, but also being able to feed some exploration through the things that are trending, we found to be very useful to get uh, people interested in then following up on, on different topics. Oh, okay, and spam detection and moderation, that's another, another huge aspect. So because we care so much about quality, obviously trying to remove things that are spammy or users that are not being uh, productive on the network and they're in either introducing spam or in it's not only about spam, it's actually about um, questions and answers that might be either offensive, insulting, not even, not answering questions and, and so on. So here um, we do have people that actually um, look at those things and they um, manually will uh, either ban users or uh, remove questions and answers from the system, but of course, that doesn't scale, and uh, we knew that from the beginning that that would not scale. Unfortunately, our machine learning algorithms are not to the point that we can just uh, close our eyes and trust them 100% and say, okay, they're gonna be doing the right thing. So we have kind of a hybrid model. We have what we call moderation queues, where we have a bunch of different algorithms feeding examples and feeding things that we suspect uh, with a certain probability that they're bad. And then we, uh, depending on the probability, those will go either uh, um, more in front or on the back of that queue, and they get revised by the actual people that take the final decision. And, and of course, anything that we do to improve those algorithms has a huge benefit in terms of cost. So we are constantly improving those algorithms um, in different ways. Um, and content creation prediction. Um, so, we're not only interested here, uh, so this is not a news reading site, so to speak, right, where we have a bunch of news coming in and we're just feeding them for people to read. We're, as, we, as I said at the beginning, we're interested in growing content. And growing content means presenting the right question to the person who's likely to answer that question. So um, when I talk about presenting things in your feed, I talk about stories and I said, it's the combination of questions and answers. On the question side, what we're really trying to answer is like, how likely are you to give a good answer to this question, right? And that's a different thing from saying, how likely are you to be interested in reading an answer to this question? So we do have another algorithm that is now 
optimizing for how, what's the probability that you'll give a good answer to a given question, given what we know about you and what we know about that given question. And that's actually something that is used not only in the feed, but it's also used in things like we have an application that's called A2A, the ask to answer. When you write a question, you come into Quora, you have a question, you, see, you decide, oh, this is not here, I'm gonna just ask this new question. You get a bunch of suggestions here on like people that are likely to have a good answer for that question. So this, um, this is kind of a interesting and, and sort of like demanding application on our uh, prediction of probability of answering a question because it, it works on real time as you, are, as you are actually typing the question and it has to, it's based on the things, basically the text on the question and the topics that have been inferred on that text and then on the, what we know about a number of users and then uh, it gives you a ranked suggestion of users that might be able to give you an answer here. Okay, so I've talked a lot, a lot about applications of machine learning and I've talked a lot about um, features and feature engineering. Uh, I've not talked about models. I'm not now going to connect the dots and tell you what model goes where, but um, I know many of you in the audience know enough about machine learning that it's not, uh, it's pretty trivial to understand. So this is a list of models that we are using somewhere in production and um, it's not very hard to connect them to the applications that I mentioned before. Um, so we use logistic regression and elastic nets, grid and boosted decision trees and random forest, uh, both tree ensembles. Then we use neural net, lambda mart as our learning to ramp up approach, and we use um, unsupervised um, approaches like uh, matrix factorization and LDA. Um, it's not that we use all these fancy methods because we like to brag about how many methods we use in, in production. It's basically because we try to optimize each case and we have this sort of like bag of different things that we try uh, all the time and uh, sometimes turns out some applications, gradient boosted decision trees work better than random forest and the other way around. So we're not religious about using one or the other and we will use whatever works best for that given case. Um, and we do have a ton of different things that we're trying, sort of like experimenting with and testing, but they still haven't made it to any of the applications, but I think there's a, a ton of different things that we could be um, using and experimenting with. Okay, so I think that's it. I'm going to finish with some conclusions. So at Quora, Although I, I talked a little bit about the size of our data, I think more than the size and the number of questions and answers and users that we have, I think the interesting thing that we have is we have this sort of complex ecosystems of data types and data relations between the types and the different things that we try to optimize for that make the problem space very interesting. Um, and our algorithms, as I said, need to understand some of those complex aspects like what does it mean to have a quality answer? What does it mean to trust a user? How do we know that a user is expert on a given topic or not? And um, we are a pretty small company as of now. Uh, the sort of like the whole company is 110 people. The engineering technical team, I include data science, some of we, whom are in the audience and you will see in the booth later. Um, it's around 75 people. But um, we think that, as you can see, we're already doing like a ton of machine learning. Uh, I think that very soon, probably half of our engineers will be doing some kind of machine learning if they're not already. So it's like gonna be really like a key thing uh, for our success. And we have so many applications of it and so many examples that I think uh, it's gonna be a very interesting part of the work that we do. Um, and we still have a lot of unsolved challenges and some of them, if you, if you think about some of the applications that I told you before and now, when you go home and you sign up for Quora, because I know you'll do that, um, you start looking at it and say, oh, uh, Xavi said that they're using this to solve this problem. I don't see it's 100% solved. So you're probably right, it's not 100% solved. So all you need to do is send your resume to me and come with me and you'll solve it, okay. So, of course, we're hiring, so uh, we have our booth outside, and I hope to talk to many of you. Thank you.